Greetings, everybody. This is Pastor Barley. I know you're shocked by some things that you're hearing. And uh, this side of my face is numb. This side of my face is okay. I hope I'm, uh, everybody can understand me, though. I wanted to let you know how I'm doing, though, and let you see me so you wouldn't be in the dark on everything that's been happening. I lost my ability to walk. I had a stroke, and I had a heart attack. It's been kind of rough, but I'm doing okay, as you can see, and I still need your prayers. I welcome your prayers. Pastor Kevin Reed and Maggie, his wife, are here. I want to introduce them in just a little bit to you. We're very happy about that. <clears throat> but we've been gone for a while. I'm still giving it my all. And uh, right now we're going to let Pastor Reed preach, and uh, we're going to have the Lord's Prayer today, communion, holy communion. I just wanted to say hello to everybody out there. I know I've been in your prayers. I know I sound kind of weird, and I definitely look kind of weird, but uh, stick with uh, us. And uh, keep praying for me. And I know, I believe I'm going to get better over time. It'll take time and prayers. And as I said, Pastor Reed is here right now to, to fill it for me, which is good. But uh, I want to introduce this family to you. And look at this walker that I have. As you can see, I'm able to walk, sort of. The reason I'm doing this is because so many want to know how I'm doing and what, how I'm getting around. So I'm showing you. But right now, I want to. Uh, Pastor Reed to come up. I'll introduce him and then Maggie. I know it's taken him quite a while to get here. He came from North Carolina. Can you see him? Yep. All right, just want to make sure everything's okay. So this is Pastor Kevin Reed. He's young. He needs your prayers. Heck, you guys have had me long enough, right? <laughs> uh, also, his wife, Maggie, is here. Would you come up, Maggie? And uh, I'm going to try to remember their children, so please forgive me for forgetting any. Uh, what's a, uh, there's uh, Matthew, would you come up? And Margaret, I think it is. So y'all can see. Okay, I hope everything. E Ethan, go on up, can I win? He's pretty big, Ethan. And Liz, Elizabeth, is. would you come up, please? So I wanted, I know this is very informal, I hope you can understand me anyway because of my uh, stroke and speech. I know it's uh, very difficult for many of you. Say hello, Kevin, though. Hello. Hello. And Maggie. Hello. And John's hello. asleep. So this is the family here. We're very excited about them being here. 
and we want to introduce them to you so you would be able to see them also and know them. And uh, today is going to be a special day. Pastor Kevin Ray will be giving his sermon. And I like to call it your first one. Your first one was your ordination. Well, his first one since you've been here in, in um, April here. I can't remember what today is. I know it's April or something. 17th, April 17th. So we're very excited about this. And I hope you're excited as well. So uh, I just wanted to say, please write us. Please give Kevin your best wishes, if you would, please. Uh, so I will sign off with this, and we will have uh, the Lord's Supper following. Thank you. Remember, I can edit this, so don't worry about any of this stuff. Baby John is sleeping. That's the only one we missed. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Huh. Uh, as I said, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. I had one young man, uh, not young, he's older than I am, actually. He's been a good friend, but he says, oh, I can't go that uh, sort of henny. It's, it's, uh, 14th day after a bib or something like that. And he says, he responded in such a way that, well, I'm not going to go because y'all are doing the wrong day. As far as I'm concerned, we can have the Lord's Supper many times. In fact, any time. And... Uh, I don't understand why people can't get together more. They find more reasons to divide, it seems. It's like, uh, Martha, are you still recording? Yeah. Mm. It's like this last week we went to a funeral of a lady we used to know that went to Colville many year, decades ago, several decades ago, and, and you know, they got divorced. But she died of breast cancer recently. She kept it kind of quiet. <laughs> Not very many people knew about it. But uh, while I was there, I was thinking, why do people go to Judeo-Christian churches after they're being fed truth? Now, are you kidding me? You're going to go get truth in a Judeo-Christian church? I don't think so. But they will come to Christian Israel Church, Anglo-Israel Church, and look for reasons to find something wrong. Really, what does that mean? Some reason to divide. Right? Oh, they, they're preaching this. I disagree with that. Oh, you mean you can go to a Judeo Christian church and find truth there? Come on. They're not really listening, and they're not really telling us the truth. Are you going because, oh, they have sweet music? They have more people? Why do you go to these Judeo-Christian churches and get fed a bunch of bull? I don't understand it. Maybe some of y'all could explain it to me. But I was sitting there thinking, why did this lady leave an Israel church and go to a Judeo-Christian church and have a Judeo-Christian minister there? I don't understand it. I've seen this happen, things like it, for a long, long time. Um, but 
I'm cut out of something obviously different because I just do not understand it, and I will not. I hope I never do because then you're participating in a lie, Pastor Varley, aren't you? You're supporting and believing a lie. These people that go to these Judeo Christian churches are giving them their support. I know they are, because they tell me. Years ago, I remember going to a uh, wedding in Reno, Lake Tahoe area. And um, the lady came up to me asking a real curious question. She says, do you see anything wrong with us going to the Judeo Christian Church? And I said, not really. That was decades ago. <clears throat> and so next thing I knew, they quit coming to the any Israel meetings where they used to come to all of our camps, listen to our tapes and stuff like that. And her husband was a great follower of, of big follower of ours and the usual truth message. But she started going to the Judeo Christian church and I thought, you mean that's all it took was for me to say something somewhat positive about the Judeo Christian church and you completely need the truth? I don't understand it. There was something that I said Obviously, they're looking for an excuse to do that. But I always scratched my head after that and had to wonder, I'm sure you will too, you'll see lots of strange things <clears throat> happen over the years. But I just wanted to tell you, uh, Kevin, we're very happy that you are here. And I know we're going to hear truth out of you. And uh, you're going to grow. It'll take time to grow. Some people you will meet will act like they have all the answers, all the solutions. They don't. No one does. Not even me. Which doesn't say much, but... Uh, This Judeo-Christian question I have wondered about for a long, long time. And see, some people have the fundamentalist excuses for going to these Judeo-Christian churches. Like I said, you're kidding me. You're going there because you're going to get truth? How many of you know you can sit through any Judeo-Christian sermon message and hear all kinds of false doctrine, yet they will sit there like they're in agreement with that false doctrine, but come to an Israel church and look for something. Oh, I can't wait for you to preach something wrong, so I criticize it. Oh, give me a break. No one has all truth. You can never think about anything. Amen? So, we're very glad to have Kevin here. We will ask you in any way that you do it to uh, say a few things about the Lord's Prayer or, or Communion. I'm sorry. And we'll partake of that Holy Communion at this time. And uh, anything you need done, I will try to do it. But uh, we're here to be blessed and on the Lord in his body. I think what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for us upon the cross is very, very sacred. We understand not enough about what happened and what took place. And as I said er, uh, and some messages a while back, it's not a cross. He wasn't uh, crucified on this 
Roman Catholic cross. Um, it was a stake straight up and down that they were crucified on, I think. I don't think it was as Roman Catholic crosses were shown today. So without yakking further, I'm going to turn over to Kevin and you just say what you need want to. And uh we'll say Amen and smile. <laughs> Uh, first, I'd like to um, thank everyone, America's Promise, and uh, the support that my wife and I have had in moving up here to Idaho, and it's the most wonderful place we've ever, ever visited, and we love the idea that we get to live here for the rest of our lives and preach the truth of the kingdom, and I appreciate you guys' uh, prayers and support, and um, it, it was really, really appreciated by us, and very humbling that you guys would uh, extend to us that kind of assistance so that we may come up here and do what it is God's asked us to do. Um, and my folks back home, I'd like to say thank you. I told them when I left that I would, uh, I told my mom and pa that I would go and preach Jesus' kingdom to Israel just as they told me. So that's what I'm here to do. Um, since it is Resurrection Sunday, to the fundamentals it's Easter, which we all know is the goddess wife of Baal, Astarte, or Ashtaroth. We refer to it as Resurrection Sunday. That's this Sunday. So I'd like to uh, start with uh, a movie. The, uh, you guys saw The Passion of the Christ, directed by Mel Gibson in 2004. Currently, it's the highest grossing rated R film of all time. Second is uh, Deadpool. Um, three, $371.4 million it grossed in the box office in 2004. Uh, it was the highest. It is the highest grossing rated R film of all time, for better or worse. But just I just put those out there because that just shows that Christians. I mean, it's it's a movie about Jesus, and it's the highest grossing one of all time. The Bible, of course, is the best selling book of all time, which is good. That's good. The Passion of the Christ Two Resurrection is in pre production right now. It's also going to be directed by Mel Gibson. It's uh, slated for 2023 release. Um, COVID and everything else has pushed it off to 2023. It was originally 2022. Uh, it's a sequel to the 2004 film, The Passion of the Christ. And this is from imdb.com, internationalmoviedatabase.com. According to it, it's going to focus on the events that occurred during the three days between the crucifixion and resurrection when Jesus Christ descended to Abraham's bosom to preach and resurrect Old Testament saints. That's the focus of this movie. It's directed by Mel Gibson once again, and he also told another writer-producer that the film will include the fall of the angels, that it takes place in hell, and it also will look at why the disciples did not recognize Jesus as they made their way to the town of Emmaus. Um, I found that troubling for, uh, I found five problems with that uh, introduction to that movie, because th what it is is, Due to the film's success, we understand that it will be seen by millions of people. And the ideas that this movie has about what it is Jesus did and what it is the resurrection is all about and the crucifixion, I thought was not without merit to bring up this, af uh, this afternoon on um, Resurrection Sunday. The five problems I found were that it preaches... And this is generally preached in most fundamentalist churches. It's accepted doctrines, just as the movie is. I'm not saying Hollywood has it all right, obviously. But the problems I found is that it preaches that hell is a real place of endless and literal torment and pain. That Jesus had to rescue the Old Testament patriarchs, which of course implies that they are not saved or even Christians. Since hell is real, then that of course follows that Satan and his demons, or fallen angels, are as well. Abraham's bosom is not a symbolic place, but rather a special place within hell not filled with pain and punishment, but a place of felicity for the pre-Christ saints. That's what they call those guys down in limbo. Uh, apparently, if you died before knowing Jesus, you're just out of luck until he comes and gets you. Tries to ex in this movie also tries to explain why the two men from Emmaus uh, had an inability to recognize Jesus. We'll cover that as well. 
And of course, it teaches extra biblical concepts about the state of the dead and the resurrected body. So you see, we're going to address those points on this Resurrection Sunday and see if we can't get some theology straight here before another high-grossing film does damage that we have to undo. First of all, hell. In the New Testament, the word hell is translated from the Greek Gehenna. Strong's number 1067 is the name for a burn pit located outside of Jerusalem for refuse and dead bodies. Figuratively, it's used as the name of a place for everlasting punishment. We understand that that's not the place that the dead go that didn't believe in Christ. They're asleep as well. Uh, according to Jeremiah 19.5, God says that the burning of sons never came into his mind. So we understand the burning hell is not a place of literal pain and torment forever and ever. And each of these points I will cover in future sermons in depth. So we're only going to touch on it, and this will help familiarize yourself with what it is we teach here at America's Promise and what it is we have to do in order to put out the fires that the fundamentalists in Hollywood start. And this actually becomes so much, it's so commonplace now that, you know, it's just generally believed by everyone to be fact. When we know it's not, it's the Bible teaches differently. Also, I'd like to mention that uh, causing our sons and daughters to walk through or pass through the file is a ten- fire is a tenant of Baal worship, and one of those tenets is most uh, positively exemplified in the fact that the burning hell doctrine is taught to our young people, and then we turn right around and wonder why it is they leave those churches. Now, what are those churches? Well, they're nothing more nor less than Church of Baal worship. Now, were the men and women of the Old Testament Christians or not? That's another thing we have to get straight here, because if Jesus had to go down and rescue them, then it implies that they didn't know Jesus, and therefore they weren't Christians. So, according to the New Testament, and I made sure this was New Testament um, scriptures only, and you guys, I'm going to read them, uh, but you can look them up later if you want to review my notes. I found that in the New Testament there are seven tenets of a Christian. One, one who has found grace in the sight of God, as mentioned in Romans 1.15, John 1.17, and Acts 4.33. According to the New Testament, a Christian is one who walks with God, Revelation 3.4. One who God protects or promises protection. There's a score of verses in the New Testament about that. You can think about the centurions, uh, the Roman centurion, they approach Jesus, he and his family. One whose house and family is saved by God, found in Acts 1.38 and 39, and Acts 16.30. I try to get at least two witnesses in every one of these points in the New Testament. One who is obedient to God, John 15.10, 1 John 2.3, Revelation 12.7. One who is righteous, number six, one who is righteous in God's sight, or one who God sees as righteous. We'll see, read that in Romans 4.5. And then number seven, according to the New Testament, a Christian is one who is blessed by God. And by the way, there's scores of scriptures about that as well. However, I will point out, instead of listing the scriptures that proves that people are blessed by God and are Christians at the same time, there is no scripture in the New Testament that, sh- that demonstrates that God blesses the heathen or those that deny the Christ. There's no blessings for them at all. Um, I didn't find any scripture in the New Testament, and I'm sure uh, if you test that, you'll find that there are none as well. Now, I'm going to, there's, of all the pre- and post-Diluvian patriarchs that we could list as examples of Old Testament Christians, I chose to go with Noah. We'll very quickly test Noah against these seven points in the New Testament to see if he was indeed a Christian and see if he passes the test. And if he was, then Jesus had no need to go down and rescue him in limbo. Um, Was Noah a Christian? Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there's number one. One who has found grace in the sight of God, Noah found grace. According to Genesis 6, 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Another mark of a Christian. Genesis 6, 13 through 14, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. 
Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms that thou shalt make within the ark, and shalt pitch it with pitch, within and without pitch. And he tells Noah how to build the ark, and what's to happen to it. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou son, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So here, God has protected Noah and his household or his family from the flood, another mark of a Christian, according to the New Testament. Genesis 6.18 states that that's... Genesis 6.18 is that he has promised God has covenanted with Noah to save his wife and his sons and his sons' sons. That would be Noah's family. Genesis 6.22, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's number five, one who is obedient to God, another mark of a Christian. Genesis 7, 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Another mark of a Christian, God sees they are righteous in God's sight. And then Genesis 9, 1 should tell us that Noah is blessed by God. Let's investigate. Genesis 9, 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. So you see here that even in the seven, just the seven that we were able to list from the New Testament, that Noah does make, he fits the description of a Christian. Now some I know will argue that Noah is not a Christian, because after all, he didn't come unto church, and he didn't confess Jesus Christ, and that would make him a non-Christian or non-believer. But who said it that you had to go through the ritual of the altar. I find none of that in the Bible. In spite of it being preached coast to coast by scores of churches in this nation, there is nothing that says, if you don't come down before my altar and confess Jesus Christ, then you are not a Christian, and I guess you're doomed to hell. That's what they preach, but it's, I find no biblical foundation about that whatsoever. Now, According to, we'll go to, I want this to be a New Testament argument for our New Testament friends. We'll go to Hebrews 11, which is a very famous chapter. It's preached all the time. That would be the faith chapter. And what do you know? Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things had not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. What did Noah become when he believed God and obeyed him? An heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah was a Christian by any test of the scripture. Hebrews 11.40 states, God having provided something better for us, that they, patriarchs listed in Hebrew 11, that they would, without us, should not be made perfect. So the resurrection, the being made perfect speaks of the resurrection of the just into everlasting life in the kingdom. Noah looked forward to that. Abraham looked forward to that. You can test all the Old Testament patriarchs, and they all make the same exact, they all fit the description of Christian. So we have to, we have to remember now, if this movie, and what's generally preached in the nation, if this movie is correct about Jesus going to hell, like I said, and rescuing the rest of these guys, we have to understand that that implies that they were not Christians. And that's not true. We've just found out that Noah, just one, Noah was Christian. And I'd like to point out also, if we turn to Acts chapter 2, which is the Pentecost, we'll have to see what's going on with David. Because if he went down to hell and got everybody... Noah and Abraham, he must have forgotten David, because according to Acts 2, verse 29, now Peter is explaining to the people that Jesus has gone up, and he's trying to straighten some things out about Jesus and David. There were some misconceptions, and of course, back then, information didn't fly around at the speed of light, so the people that weren't there to witness it had some questions, and Peter was straightening out the details for them. According to Acts 2, 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. We go to verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, 
But he saith to himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy, tho- thy foes my footstool. And you hear, so Peter is straightening out that Jesus went and ascended into glory, not David. And the people were confused, and Peter's like, oh no, and David's still dead in the ground. As Christians, we understand that dead in the ground is asleep. He's in Sheol, he's in hell, he's been covered up. A hole in the ground, Hades for the Greek. And it's odd here that after preaching this on Pentecost, now when they heard this, the crowd... They were pricked in their hearts, that's another word of convicted, of the truth, and said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this preaching, whatever it is that that Peter just preached, this was enough to convince those those men listening to be Christian. One of the things he preached to them was that David was still dead in the ground and that Jesus had ascended. That's the true gospel. Another thing I'd like to point out since we're sitting right here at it. They did this gladly, received the word, this verse 41, and were baptized. In the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 Christians right there on the spot. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking in bread and in prayers. The fellowship came after the doctrine. So don't go run off to another church because of the fellowship is more important than the doctrine. No, the doctrine is more important than the fellowship because they heard the preachings, then continued in the fellowship. That's biblical. That was a strict departure from my sermon this morning, but since we were right there, I'd like to point that out. It's very important doctrine. Number three, the problem with this movie, fallen angels, real or not, oh boy. We're only going to touch on this. Uh, I expect one of these days, Lord willing, I will make a series of sermons exposing and defining Mystery Babylon. Uh, That will take quite some time. It's a little project I'm working on so that we can lighten. And I'm sure you guys, you know, I'm preaching the choir. But there are those out here that are thousands of people that have the ear of or that I have the ear of during this broadcast because of the foundation of America's promise that are s- confused about Mystery Babylon. And, it, and they rightly so. It's, it's preached a hundred different ways. If they even do preach it, most of the time it's erroneous. So according to Revelation 12, 1 through 5, this is one of the places I believe that they get this, uh, you know, the, uh, the fallen angels deal. Most people understand, um, most people have heard these verses and there appeared, appeared a great wonder in heaven, a, wo- a woman under this, um, Revelation 12, 1, with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. We understand that in Bible prophecy, the sun, the moon, and the stars are always indicative of the house of Israel. We'll find that out when we go back and read about Joseph's dream, the sun and the moon and the stars. In Genesis, the book of beginnings. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born." Those five verses are the subject of so much controversy. I'm not going to get into much detail with it, but I believe that is where the concept of this fallen angels and the tail and the stars. And we have to understand, the woman, this is, here's a cheat sheet to Revelation. Revelation is a book of the past, present, and future. When we talk about future prophecy, we would never take it literally because it's symbolism. Otherwise, if we took everything literally out of this book of Revelation, we're going to have to go out there and look for seven-headed beasts, a giant woman, a giant red beast, walk uh, mountains and islands, standing up and walking around. Obviously, that's not going to happen. We know that. It could, but we understand that that's Bible symbolism, just as water symbolizes the word, bread symbolizes the word, and... Mountains in Bible prophecy always mean nations. I will say the only thing you do take literally in Bible prophecy are cardinal directions. We always take cardinal directions literally in Bible prophecy. The woman here symbolizes Israel. She's going to have a child, and we know that that child was Jesus the Christ. 
born through the house of Israel, the Davidic line, the branch of Jesse. The dragon was going to devour her child as soon as it was born. If the stars in verse 4 are literal stars, the earth would have been destroyed many, many times over. We understand that. There's even disaster movies about that one. They got that right. Um, So heaven here is something different than the heaven of the skies. After reading chapter 13, which I'm not going to read, but you are more than welcome to, I heartily in, uh, encourage you to, if you read chapter 13 of Revelation, we can see that this beast represents a great world power which rose up out of the sea or out of the nations, Bible symbolism again, and ruled on earth for a period of time. We're not talking about literal beasts up in outer space. If you want to find those, most often you'll find them in comics. So or Hollywood movies. But in the Bible, this is not a literal beast in outer space. This is a dragon beast system that represents a ruling power on the earth. We always know that in Bible symbolism, on the earth is always what God and Je- what Jesus is talking about in his parables. The field is the world every time. He took a lot of time to tell us about how we're to conduct ourselves on earth only to get raptured off someday. Awfully foolish of Jesus to spend all that time on our behavior on earth if we're just going to be whisked off one day in some magical rapture of the church or the the bride or the, I don't know. I can't keep it straight. It's easier to just read the Bible and take it for what it is, honestly, than to try to figure out their stuff. Now, another thing they brought up was that the the saints here had gone to Abraham's bosom, right? And um, that's mentioned actually once in the, the entire Bible. That's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And Luke, uh, that story is found in Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. Luke 16, 22 is where you'll find the phrase Abraham's bosom. And it says that the beggar died and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The word bosom appears in the New Testament five times and is translated from the same Greek word in every case. So again, this is a situation where we can find out its exact meaning. According to Strong's number 2859, kulpos, meaning lap, chest, or bay. It relates of the, of the practice in the second temple period of Israel, a practice of re- reclining while eating, and the closest guest in proximity, physical proximity to the host, was said to have his head on his chest or his bosom because they all reclined and they kind of looked like fallen over dominoes. And... Uh, that was where we get the word bosom. That's the concept behind it. In Judaism and Judeo-Christianity, the bosom of Abraham is considered to be a special place in hell set apart by a great gulf where a whole host of men and women reside because they died before Christ was born and before his crucifixion, resulting in their sins not being covered. This arrangement is temporary, however, And as supposedly Jesus went down to hell and rescued them, in addition to the belief that people who trust in Jesus now go directly to heaven upon death or hell. So you see, Abraham's bosom used to be the limbo you went to. And as a matter of fact, the Catholic Church still preaches that. And over the years, interestingly enough, limbo has become more of the Christian heaven. So limbo is not half as bad as it used to be for whatever reason. But, um, but now we've done away with all that because, after all, you will die when you go to heaven. Or you'll, when you go to heaven, you'll, you'll go to heaven when you die. So Abraham's bosom was for the old guys that were just out of luck before Jesus came along, that little period there. And it makes Jesus out to be pretty weak, if you ask me. But we know that in the, and we'll touch on this again later, we know that in the rich man and Lazarus, it's a parable. And you understand, parables in Jesus' day are a lot like our political cartoons. We see them all the time. They use caricatures and symbols and symbolism to represent something that we know is going on. So in looking at the parables, if we take them with that context, they start to make a lot more sense on maybe political or economic commentary of the day, or maybe something that was easily understood by the people of ancient Israel. And you understand, God understands who we are as his children, and sometimes he had to make things very simple so that we could get it. In the military, we called it breaking it down Barney style or breaking out the Crayolas. And sometimes you have to do that in order to get the concept to sink in, and of course, repetition is key. So we know that Lazarus depicts Israel and the rich man depicts Esau, Edom. And if we don't understand that, I will get into that one of these days, God willing. Abraham's bosom depicts the Christian rest. And we'll read about the Christian rest in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 11. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 11 states, and this is just one case of the rest. It's all over the Bible. You can also read about it in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, according to, uh, but I wanted this to be a New Testament argument to prove to you that they're using the New Testament, but just bits and pieces that work out for them. They won't bother reading the entire thing and putting it together because the truth of the Bible should and does harmonize from Genesis to Revelation. If it doesn't, then it's man's concept of it that's wrong. Never the Bible. The Bible never contradicts itself. The rest, chapter 4, Hebrews, verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, those that believe in him, for he that is entereth into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And as you see, if you keep reading, you'll see those are very famous verses on down. The word is quick and sharper than a two-edged sword. But you see here it says, so what does that mean? Well, what that means is, Abraham's bosom represents the rest. The rest is the rest of the kingdom, which is the rest restoration of national Israel unto the Abrahamic covenant in this Christian age. Now, I understand all that disappears if we believe that all prophecy has ceased and all prophecy has been fulfilled in 70 AD. Obviously, it hasn't. Israel is dead to the world through Christ, and new believers and its believers can enjoy the blessings promised to Abraham now in the kingdom, and when it's fully realized, of course, the Abrahamic covenant will be fully realized, and then Israel has its true rest, the rest of the kingdom. And very quickly, we're going to go over the other ones. Number five, we had the two men from Emmaus. That story is told in Luke 24, verses 15 through 16. And what's going on is they're walking together, and this is just after Jesus' death and crucifixion, and they... Uh, Jesus approaches them and starts riding, walking right along with them down the road. I intend to do an in-depth sermon on this one as well, so I'm just going to hit the finer points very quickly. And Jesus, in his power, causes the men's eyes or something cognitively within them that they won't recognize or didn't recognize who Jesus was. And in verses 25 and 26, Jesus then explained to them that they should have believed the law and the prophets concerning himself and not necessarily his physical manifestation to them that would have led to their belief. So we'll get into that again. But the reason why, and the, the movie was trying to address why they didn't recognize Jesus, and it, it's not this huge mystical magic trick that Jesus did. What he did is he, he illustrated that the law and the prophets is what makes you the believer. Because if Jesus just appears and you believe in him, then there's no conviction. There's no overturning of your old life. The Law and the Prophets is the path to Jesus Christ. Always has been. You won't hear that preached in modern church circles anymore because it doesn't allow people to keep doing what they want to do. So, and you Gentiles, we've been told, you Gentiles, that law is for the Jews and it's not for you. It's been put away and prophecy isn't for you either. And then, of course, number six. The last point I'd like to make about the damage this movie causes in the general public's eyes in the general Christian's eyes, what it does as the perception of what the true gospel is, the state of the dead. The state of the dead is very clearly explained throughout the movie, throughout the Bible. However, scores of churches preach that you live forever because you go directly to heaven or hell immediately upon death. You see, so what they always say is that the penalty for the Bible always states that the penalty for sin is death in every case. But what they've turned it all around, and they said, no, the penalty for death is eternal life. Well, yes, I know in hell, but you never really die. You either go to, you keep right on living, either in a burning hell or heaven. And they've got this whole gospel turned around. But I'd like to read you a few verses, just a few, of what exactly the Bible has to say about the state of the dead. We'll consult wisdom, we'll consult one of the books of wisdom, Ecclesiastes, which is Solomon's wisdom, and all of Solomon's wisdom uh, reflects the law, of course. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Chapter 9, I read verse 5, the wisdom of Solomon. For the living 
know that they shall die, but the dead know not any thing, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. King Solomon says that the dead know not any thing. They're asleep. They're quiet. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So again, they know not anything. Let's turn to Job chapter 3. He also had some things to say about death. And if you read through Job, you'll find that God said that Job didn't lie or gave false testimony or false witness about anything he said. Now his wife did, his friends did, but Job remained, which is why after his tribulation he was rewarded with the even more than he had lost. We all know the story. Job is also said to be the oldest book in the Bible, by the way. Job chapter 3, 13. For now I should have, and Job is in such turmoil at the state he's in now that he's wishing for death. And listen to what he says about the state of death that he wishes to be in. For now should I have lain still and been quiet, and I should have slept, then I would have been at rest. Job understands that in death, he would have lain still, he would have been quiet, he would have been asleep, and he would have been at rest. 3, 17. There the wicked cease from troubling. Where? The grave. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together, they hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. So there again, Job is explaining what happens in the grave. And the physical life he had now that was in such turmoil, he wished that it would end so he could go to sleep and remember it not, and be at rest. The dead are asleep, in, asleep and they remain so until the resurrection. This truth is verified in hundreds of pa uh, passages in God's word. And I know on the Resurrection Sunday, I wanted to read, I wanted to make those points to you guys. As we start off on a, with this ministry, I wanted to pick up where I left off last time and start with some sermons that would have some series in them, some things that would start building up our knowledge or reinforcing or reaffirm what it is we know so that I know that we're all growing together because it's the only way that steel can sharpen steel. It's the only way that we can all be on the same page of music. It's like Dave Barley said, he's confused about why people would leave a church that teaches, teaches truth and then turn right around and go to one that lies to them. And of course, go and give their tithes and offerings to that same pastor that does nothing more nor less than do violence to the kingdom message. And I'm up here preaching, and I know I'm going to say some very bad words, but we're up here in this, par this church, and we preach accountability, responsibility, that we have to submit to Christ's authority as king and be under his law. We preach the validity and the abiding, the abiding of the law and the prophets. And I'd just like to read, in closing, a verse that states what it is that God has prepared for us and why it is that we're to understand what Jesus has done on the cross what he did, and what it is that the, to what end that does for him, what it is that he's done for us, his children, the apple of his eye, his firstborn. It's quite impactful. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. I'll close with this. If I can get there. I said at the conference I didn't mark my Bible verses so you could get there as quickly as I can. Because some people would complain that I fly around too fast. But it is written, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of the man the things which God hath prepared for him that love him. Now that says, for it is written, we should also check where that came from. That would be Isaiah 64. We'll consult that real quick. Isaiah 64, verse 5. For since the beginning of the world, 
Men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Verse 5. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those in continuance, and we shall be saved. So we understand that there are things that God has given to us, and there are things that God will, will give to us, and it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. That's what he says. All we have to do is be in obedience to him, Remember that the Old Testament states very clearly what Christians are and what, they're, and what they're to be seen doing, one of which is working in the vineyard of the Lord of hosts. And I hope that uh, through my time here, I'll continue to instruct you and that you'll teach me and I'll teach you and we'll support one another in working in the vineyard, Amen. being good Christian witnesses, telling you what a Christian is, telling you what the law is, so we can go out and be light as we're supposed to be to this nation. Because right now Israel isn't so great. We failed in our primary mission to bring the light of the word to the world. We haven't done it. So we're going to try to change that. We're going to do our part. And I'm after the second crown, and I know you guys are as well. And that's all I have, folks.